I wonder if there is any book in the history of the world that has been more burdened with irrelevant and misleading praise than Stendhal's Chartreuse de Parma. I have looked over what you could call the critical reception for this book. And a significant footnote here, I'm looking at this in English. I did not look at the French literature or French critical response to it, so on and so forth. And uh, without getting into my autobiography, this is a book I have heard about and seen references and allusion to my whole life, including in like straight political science, political philosophy literature, quoting it. It's a massively influential book, but the situation in 2023, at least in the English language, seems to be this. Um, people don't know what to say in response to this book, and they want to dissimulate being at a high enough level of historical knowledge and political sophistication to truly appreciate the book, so they just throw utterly irrelevant and really false and misleading praise on Stendhal's name. I'm reminded of a short television documentary I saw decades ago uh, that was talking about how the increasing media coverage of the fashion industry changed the way fashion designers, stylists, people who were serious about clothing and fabric and textiles talked about themselves and presented what was happening that year. That for decades, everyone in the industry had kind of understood okay, the New Year's collections are coming out and they represent some kind of incremental improvement over last year's collection. There's no expectation things would be shockingly new and different from one year to the next. Like, okay, you do gray men's suits this year. It's a slightly different style of gray men's suits from last year. There's some slight adjustments. But as increasingly there were news photographers, television reporters present at these things, everyone felt some sort of uh, social pressure on themselves to describe each and every fashion show as if it presented a paradigm shift in the philosophy of what a pair of pants ought to be, in the philosophy of what a suit and tie ought to look like. And of course, blatantly, this was this was not true. And uh, anyway, the ultimate sort of point of, of um, uh, shall we say, capitulation in these interviews was when people had nothing at all to say and would retreat behind what became a commonly... Um, commonly invoked canard that, well, you know, this show was just all about the clothes, <laughs> as if fashion could be about anything other than the clothes. The most common praise heaped upon Stendhal is that it has tremendous psychological realism. <laughs> and I think with this uh, statement, the critic or commentator, whoever they are, they, they really discredit themselves. This book does not even attempt to contain psychological realism. It is psychologically surreal. The author not only has no interest in psychological realism, he's very much intentionally doing the opposite with the psychology uh, of his characters. Now, what do I mean by the opposite? Stick with me for a moment, dear viewer, and, and I will explain. There are really two different tones to this book that the author shifts back and forth between. And I, I may say he shifts back and forth between them quite amateurishly. And he was an amateur when he wrote this book, and he didn't live for all that long thereafter. On the one hand, there is the tone of castigating political conditions in his time. And the author, Stendhal, knew a great deal about the political conditions in his time, both inside and out. He wasn't a military man, which is, in some ways, he's at a disadvantage of writing this novel. He's not very good at writing about battles and the tide of history and war and that, that side of history. But what he did know tremendously well is the world of bureaucracy, the world of courtiers, gossip, and intrigue within the halls of power, within the chambers of power. He knew how to write about that. And he is writing this book with the harshest condemnation imaginable of what politics had become after the collapse of the regime of Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, <laughs> this is not to say he is an uncritical fan of Napoleon Bonaparte or the Bonapartist regime. This is not to say that he's an uncritical fan of what the French Revolution really was or what it became as the years went by and it was corrupted. On the contrary, 
if you really know and understand the politics of the period, within the first 30 pages, you will think this is going to be a condemnation of Napoleon and of Bonapartism, of the Napoleonic tendency, which it is not. Um, Stendhal is at that level of sophistication of being able to excoriate and ridicule and heap scorn upon Napoleon personally, Napoleonic regimes, generally the Napoleonic tendency, but of really recognizing and appreciating that what Napoleon offered was fundamentally and profoundly better than what we could call the anti-Napoleonic regimes that tried to drag Europe back to the Dark Ages. Now, to what could I compare this in our own times? Imagine a book written with similar alacrity from the perspective of a Vietnamese person who was part of the American regime in Vietnam. Now, what do I mean by the American regime? The pro-democracy, pro-capitalist regime allied with the United States of America, and who is aware of everything wrong with that regime, aware of its shortcomings, but who is also aware that what came after the Americans left Vietnam, after the Americans gave up supporting that regime, is far worse, that the communist regime that came after was far worse. Imagine if we had a novel like this written by someone who really worked inside the American regime in Afghanistan and who knew everything wrong, everything bad about the pro-American, pro-democracy, pro-capitalist regime in Afghanistan, but they're also aware that the Taliban is in, incomprehensibly worse. It's impossible to exaggerate how much worse the anti-American regime was. I would say this is how you have to appreciate Stendhal's uh, position. Although some of his characters, the, 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 not Stendhal speaking, but when his characters speak, some of them are recklessly pro-Napoleon, are recklessly pro-French Revolution. You have to realize he is also ridiculing those characters. And in the political portions of the book, ridicule he does. Like, I wish I could say to you this book was divided between serious political material and the more silly melodramatic material, which I'll talk about next. But the political material, I don't think you ever go a full page without a joke. There's a lot of, uh, I mean, should you call it satire? Should you call it farce? Um, he is making fun of everyone and everything at every step of the uh, of the political discourse. So again, just, just to give a, a simple example, you know, yes, he is ridiculing the anti-Napoleon tendency, the tendency in Europe at that time that's trying to drag Europe back to an aristocratic tradition um, that's based on sources as ancient as Cicero, you know. Um, he is trying to ridicule that tendency, but he is also uh, ridiculing the Republicans, the people who want to escape from monarchy, medieval traditions of kingship, but who on the one hand are drawn towards the example of the French Revolution and Napoleon, but who on the other hand are, of course, attracted to examples even more ancient than Cicero <laughs> uh, from ancient Greece and, and ancient Rome. And he's aware of how ridiculous all of these people are. And he's aware that all of them are instead, this is transitioning to now talking about the melodrama side of it, they're all completely consumed with their own sex lives. They're all completely consumed with the pursuit of money, wealth, luxury, so on and so forth, which from Stendhal's pr perspective and from mine, makes them ridiculous, makes them despicable, makes them laughable. Uh, I would put to you the question, is there a single character in this whole book? And it's a long book. It is a long book. Is there a single character the reader is supposed to regard as morally positive? And the answer is no. There is not one. And if you think there is a hero in this book, if you think there is a single morally positive character, you are not politically sophisticated enough to understand the book. This is not a book divided between good guys and bad guys. I would even go so far as to say, when you look at the smaller peasant characters, some of whom do something very positive, they're these kind of nameless, poverty-stricken peasants who every so often show up in the story and, and help the, the hero or help uh, assist in something. He really takes the time to show you how petty and evil their motives are and what terrible people they are in other ways. So there's some peasant who shows up and does something kind and generous to, the, to, to one of the major characters. But we're also told that this person is an alcoholic and they 
they're they live with a prostitute in the situation and they've been trying to get money out of this person for years. There are enough little details so you really get a sense of what an immoral and self-interested person this this peasant is, who emerges very often, they disappear soon thereafter. Th th those are not, you know, major, major characters in the story. And it, it's perhaps needless to say, all of the aristocrats, we get a, a very deep, complex sense of what terrible people they are. And the so-called middle class people, most of whom are trying to claw their way up into the aristocracy. This is a, <laughs> now I was going to say, this is a bleak portrait, but it's not because he's laughing all the way through. He's cackling with laughter at all these people. Now, when you shift into discussing the other side of the story, um, the melodrama, the type of laughter is very different. And I really, I pity the other YouTubers who have made videos about this book. And I, I pity the few, you know, uh, written sources I've looked at, the review articles, whatever you want to say. Um, I pity them because these people are not sophisticated enough to realize that the melodrama side of the book, it is itself a parody of a whole genre. So I'd compare this to the American tradition of horror movies that are not really horror movies. Where, you know, so so there have been movies in America like Scream and so on, where the audience from the first minute they sit down, they are familiar with the conventions of the horror movie. And they're aware that the writer, the screenwriter, is in some ways attacking those uh, those conventions. To a much greater extent, he is attacking um, what you could call both the moral and immoral elements of the standard schlocky melodramatic novel of his time. He is really aware that he's alive at a time when mainstream successful literature and fiction, um, it's presenting you constantly with this corny moral to the story. You know, like, oh, no good deed goes unrewarded. No bad deed goes unpunished. Um, this a really awful sense of, you know, a, a more of just world fallacy, a moral universe where karma pays off and everything makes sense. It, he, he's really, um, anyway, he, he, I, frankly, I feel like he's enraged against the mediocrity of most of the novels of his time. This is one side of it. But also the immorality. He is very interested in and he is uh, satirizing, parodying, exaggerating, joking about the extent to which all of these novels only appeal to their readers through their sheer salaciousness, through sin, through reveling in sin, you know, and this is a time when a lot of people are deeply Catholic, a lot of people are deeply Christian one way or the other, and where the thrill of reading about these, um, these sinful people overwhelmed with uh, desire and so on, you know, that this is what sells books. And again, he's heaping scorn on all of that. You really can't, you can't understand the novel if you don't understand how implicitly hilarious it is for him as a writer and how hilarious it should be for you as a reader to read about a Catholic priest who, in his full robes as a Catholic priest, is put in prison for fighting a duel over who gets to fuck the blonde girl from an actor troupe, a blonde actress that he saw on stage and had a had a crush on, right? He gets into a duel with her, with the guy who had been her main boyfriend before he steps into her life. He's put in prison for this. And of course he has the rosary beads. He has these beads and he has a prayer book. He has all this, this, this Catholic stuff. And he spends all of his time in prison obsessing over the next girl he's going to fuck and staring out the window and being consumed with passion for her. Like, if you read this as a humorless commentary on anything, if you read this as like psychological realism, and what could be more absurd than seeing this as psychological realism? No, I mean, he is really showing you from his perspective, and it's not a balanced perspective. He's showing you this is who these priests are. This is who these aristocrats are. This is how the system works. He is very interested to show you exactly how this particular priest, the same guy in prison, gets promoted for reasons that have nothing to do with his personal virtue or skill or talent or anything else, how he uses family connections and corruption and so on to be advanced when he doesn't have a pious bone in his body and so on. And again, uh, Stendhal is, is utterly, utterly atheist. He's a nihilistic atheist in the, in the truest sense of the term. If you think he contrasts this to 
morally good and pious priests. No, we get at least two priests who are, um, uh, you know, studied in some depth in the book as contrast to that, that main character. And they're terrible people, but they're terrible people in different ways, you know? So we do get to see some sketches of true believers and how they, how they fit into the system. Now, again, I just want to mention this. Uh, I think many people reviewing this book would, and I'm just being honest with you, I haven't seen a single, I haven't seen a single review that reflects even the most elementary understanding of what this book is and what it's about. So I'm mean, congratulating. If you've somehow clicked on this video, I think you have by luck or virtue or good fortune clicked on the only YouTube video that in any way describes to you what this book is about or why it's important or why it's interesting. And if there are any articles written about this in English from a perspective of someone who understands, but I haven't, I haven't found them. I, I I would imagine there's at least somewhere at some point someone wrote something intelligent about this in French. But again, I haven't seen it because I wasn't I wasn't looking in French. Um, if someone else were making this video or writing this or writing a, an article about this, I do think it would be easy to misrepresent the book as if it is only interested in uh, lampooning, satirizing and criticizing the Catholic Church the aristocracy, the establishment powers. And a large part of the book is doing that. And again, most people reading this don't even catch that, that that really is the point of these political passages of the book and so on. Um, I think it's important to note that even if it's in there briefly, he really does go after and criticize and lampoon the revolutionaries also. So you have a character who is a poet living in the woods, trying to lead a revolution against the king of Parma so that he can establish and go back to an ancient Greco-Roman style republic or democracy. Um, everything about that character, I mean, it is a portrait of um, the type of extremist who was left over by the rise and fall of the French Revolution, to some extent by the rise and fall of Napoleon. Right. And again, he's also a terrible person. We get enough details given to us about how he treats his wife and how he neglects his kids. And we, we get he very intentionally gives us enough reasons to hate or despise this guy. There's no way to regard him as a as a hero or as a morally good uh, uh, person. So, you know, this is one type of fragment of the dream of the French Revolution. That's this is one type of ghost haunting Europe after the collapse of the French Revolution. But another one um, is the Count who becomes Prime Minister in Parma. So if you guys know Game of Thrones, this guy, this Count, he becomes Prime Minister. He is in a position very much like the Hand of the King in Game of Thrones. Which is to say he, he, he isn't a king or a ruler, but he is the, the, he is the king's main assistant who really is making a lot of the day-to-day -day decisions about what goes on. He's managing the kingdom to a very large extent. Um, that character... Everyone perceives him as right wing, so to speak. Everyone perceives him as a monarchist and traditionalist and so on. But in reality, he is a veteran of the Napoleonic Wars who's deeply committed to the principles of both the French Revolution and, you know, the, the, the best aspects of uh, Bonapartism, you might say. Um, you know, but what, again, <laughs> you can't look at him as a positive uh, role model, as a hero. He is a character who has sold out everything he believes in and everyone he believes in. He's a perfect hypocrite. Um, he is a perfect courtier. He is every day doing things that he considers evil. And even though it's, it's handled quite briefly, um, the man who is in charge of the prison and torturing people in this kingdom, he also is one of these fragments where really he was a pro-democracy, pro-French Revolution person who has ended up settling down and making his compromise um, with the governments that succeeded after the failure of the French Revolution with the, the new status quo. Now that seemingly, durably, the whole world has given up on uh, democracy and republicanism. Now, there is a telling comment in the in the book um, that there's that this is said once very briefly, and there are, there are many of these political statements where it's really the author speaking to you directly, not one of the comments. But one of, one of the statements is simply, um, well, there's no point supporting a revolution now. Just look at the state of the people of Italy, their, their level of education. It'll be approximately 100 years before Italy can make the transition to democracy. And 
that that estimate, <laughs> given the time the the book is is set in and so on. Yeah, you know what, Stendhal, you were just about bang on. It was about a hundred years before Italy had a shot at making the transition to, to democracy and republicanism. So, so the author was aware that he was kind of living through a temporary uh, period when when the world had given up on uh, democracy and republicanism, or Western Europe had, or what have you. But that it wouldn't last forever. From the perspective of many of the characters in this book, of course, there's no reason to think it's temporary. The French Revolution came and went. There's no reason to think the future of Europe at that time was going to look like what was already the present tense reality in uh, the United States of America. The United States of America is mentioned just a few times. And they, hey, guys, it's 2023. The United States of America actually does symbolize something very bright and positive, a far off uh, dreamt of hope for a better world and a better future for Western Europe. So that's also interesting to see and interesting to feel. Um I feel that I haven't said quite enough about the directly political portions of the book. Uh, if you guys have a question, you can, if you have anything intelligent to say, you can ask. We're doing this with a live, live studio audience. If you have nothing intelligent to say, by all means, continue saying nothing. <laughs> um, you know, I have to admit, for me in reading the book, I would feel a certain kind of boredom and frustration when it made this very amateurish transition from the directly political parts to these more melodramatic portions. And Stendhal is an amateur. There are many elements of the melodramatic writing that are poorly done. And I'm not here to boast you of what a great novelist I am because I haven't published a novel myself. But I feel completely confident that I could write a better sword fight. Um, I could write a better gunfight than he writes. Uh, I could write a better scene of a man climbing down a stone wall who's afraid to die. Again, none of these things have any psychological realism. The action portions of the story are handled very poorly, very amateurishly. And, you know, the, the romance per se, aside from its function in kind of being a, a condemnation, not just of the characters, but of the social system as a whole, it's also not... Uh, well-written. I mean, there's nothing sexy about the book. There's nothing truly romantic about the book. And you certainly are introduced to Stendhal's almost Schopenhauerian version or view of, of sexuality. He is certainly someone interested in the contrast between the then relatively new theory of evolution, an evolutionary view of human biology and sexuality, and the traditions of the church. And if you guys don't know, Schopenhauer, Arthur Schopenhauer, was really the first person writing about that. Uh, yeah, okay, I admit, there were some guys even earlier than Schopenhauer who were even crazier. But, you know, this is a, a big, dramatically, fundamentally new view of the world once you see romance as a competition for who was going to provide the next generation. And again, Schopenhauer was interested in the contrast between strong-willed people and weak-willed people and opposites attract and these things. Things that for us are completely normal now but were then shockingly new and were a contrast to a, a Catholic uh, view of the world and view of marriage and view of sex and view of uh, reproduction and raising children. But yeah, throughout the book, um, I was kind of frustrated when we transitioned to these melodramatic passages that are in some crucial ways poorly written. And then I'd be delighted when like, often, often it's quite sudden without any kind of artful... Um, a segue or transition, suddenly we went back to dealing with these details of how, how politics really works. And again, this includes things like the politics of how particular people are appointed to particular jobs, how they're promoted, uh, how the corrupt court system works, um, how bribes are paid and received. There's a lot of detail. Oh, how the newspapers work, how the government controls the newspapers. Now the government puts people in prison for reading the wrong newspaper. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of this kind of interest, um, in the political setting, something I said to several friends and like all three different people or something, when I first started reading the book, within say the first 30 page or, uh, pages or first 50 pages, I said, look, everyone on the internet who is pretending to have appreciated this book is engaging in a kind of fraud. Um, the, just just the, the depth of what's going on in the first several scenes of the book, shall we say, 
um, the level of sophistication and prior knowledge and familiarity you have to have of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars is very high. And a lot of people are rushing through reading this book in a university program in English translation, and they do not have any of that background, and they are not taking the time to go and look things up on Wikipedia. Like, I don't even know if you could do it that way. If you do not have years and years of in-depth prior understanding of the historical period, uh, the first several chapters, however you want to put it, the first 50 pages or 100 pages, which really are a masterpiece, will be totally wasted on you. And I'm just being real, most of the responses I've seen to this book, they look like they're written by people who rushed through the first hundred pages and then skipped ahead to the ending. Um, again, maybe they were reading in a college program. Maybe they weren't rushed to read in a college program, but they were so kind of baffled and confused by the first 50 pages, first hundred pages, that they, they really didn't feel they could continue and they just wanted to be able to pretend they've read and appreciated this book. And then again, they, they produce this sort of a misleading literature of praise for the book that has nothing to do with what its uh, redeeming qualities really are. Um, I've said this about an, an author as mainstream as Aristotle. You really can't understand Aristotle. I'm not saying you can't appreciate Aristotle. I'm saying on a very basic level, you can't understand Aristotle without having a sense of when he is joking and when he is not. And again, even just within the first 50 pages, I think many, many people are struggling with this book because they have no idea when the author is joking and, and when he is being serious. And obviously a, a prior familiarity with the political history that's being invoked, some of which goes back to Cicero, like some of which goes back to ancient Greek and ancient, ancient Rome, which I've got, and some of which is germane to just that century or just that decade or what have you. It really is necessary to even appreciate what's happening in the first part of the book. So anyway, we've apparently kind of um, developed a 21st century culture of pseudo appreciation for this book from people who have no understanding of what it's about or why it's an important book. And who say things like, oh, yes, you know, like the psychological realism of the romance. That's why the book is worth reading. Um, I, I, I just can't imagine, I, I don't want to spoil the plot for you here, but <laughs> it's like like a 10-year-long incestuous romance between an aunt and her teenage nephew. So this is an aunt who wants to sleep with her nephew for a period of like 10 years and who takes her nephew who she wants to sleep with and it, it takes him from a military career and forces him into a a career in the priesthood, perhaps kind of, sort of, because she wants to be able to bang him on the side. You think this is psychologically realistic? <laughs> it's, it's, it's utterly preposterous and uh, quite intentionally so. You know, when you understand what it is Stendhal is railing against, you will see why he is uh, giving us these, these over-the-top, um, you know, characters consumed with uh, you know, these desires and so on. So uh, Brian says, quote, read the original French or you haven't read it. This is a new translation by Richard Howard, uh, which is attempting to make it comprehensible in English. Uh, so this is 2000, um, 1999, perhaps in hardcover, 2000. This is a relatively recent attempt to render in English. I've got to tell you, Brian, I call bullshit on your claim that you have to read it in the original French. The problem is not the gap between French and English. And I'm sorry to pull rank on you. I was just talking about this with Melissa last talking about this with Melissa last night for totally unrelated reasons. But when you are familiar with the gap between English and Sanskrit, when you are familiar with the gap between English and classical Chinese, when you are even familiar with the gap between English and Japanese, English and Thai, Laotian, Cambodian, I have dealt with things that are really hard to translate from one language to another, from one era to another. No, the gap between French and English is not the problem. The problem is the ignorance of the modern reader, the political ignorance. 
for the social and political milieu this is this is written for and that as i say in little ways it's railing against i think that's easy enough for you guys to, to visualize though the way in which comedy the way in which satire rails against the very thing it's it's ridiculing or making fun of that's that's the sense in which i mean it's really it really has to be understood uh in that context and i've got to tell you something it helps to have read plutarch like it really helps i mean even just the references to you know julius caesar that are found throughout this if you haven't read plutarch's life of caesar if you're not pretty well versed in the kind of classical Greek and Roman literature that he as an author presumes his entire audience grew up, you know, deeply familiar with. Um, there's a lot of stuff you're not going to get. You're not going to appreciate. Okay. Now the title of this video indicates to you in dramatic fashion that this book is now going through a strange sort of Renaissance of public interest because it has been promoted by a notorious demagogue known as Jordan Peterson. And as a result, there's an even stranger literature of appreciation for this book, reviews and responses and a couple of YouTube videos produced by people who only heard of this book and only thought to read it because Jordan Peterson has mentioned and promoted it. And it's it's on his list of 100 great books. He has mentioned and promoted on, on Twitter. I assume he has at some point mentioned it on YouTube or in a podcast. I haven't been through the record of that. That's harder to search than, than Twitter. And for whatever reason, if you look up his, his list of great books, his list of recommended reading, this is very prominently in the number one position. It is the number one uh, top of the list book. And again, these sort of uh, Jordan Petersonians, these followers of Jordan Peterson, they look at this book and examine this book in a very peculiar way because they're searching for the type of neoconservative, and I might even say neo-Christian moralizing, that they associate with, with Peterson himself. And boy, are they ever searching in vain. Uh, Stendhal is an atheistic nihilist to his core. And there is probably no audience worse prepared for the morality and immorality of Stendhal and what his message is. Um, his message politically his message personally for like how you ought to live your life in this world for however many years you've gotten this earth. Um, you know, it would be selling him short to say that he's a brute sensualist. Although in part he is. Uh, it's difficult to imagine anyone who is more of an antithesis of, of Jordan Peterson and including, I'll get into one of the differences between Stendhal and myself. Stendhal is certainly closer to the sort of egoistic evil of someone like Max Stirner, of saying to you, kind of, get out and lie. Get out and live a lie, because if that's all you've got to live, get out and wear a mask. Get out and be someone you're not. Um, he certainly is saying to you, and I, I think he lacked an awareness of the biological reality of inbreeding, um, if if you're in love with your aunt, he's telling you to get out and get into bed with your aunt and so on. He is not interested in the moral um, restrictions of the Catholic Church and tradition. Now, as, as I mentioned, it, it just so happens the Catholic Church is opposed to inbreeding. Modern biology and science is also opposed to inbreeding, but he doesn't seem to know that. He is absolutely, you know, in favor of you embracing a life of reckless, high risk, high consequence, um, duels at dawn and, and what have you. And he is also very much interested in you. Uh, I mean, sorry, it's, it's a funny thing to say. Quite a few of his characters uh, make a moral compromise in choosing to be a part of and choosing to support a monarchist regime when really in their hearts, they're ideologically committed to democracy, republicanism, to the opposite tendency, to the pro-French revolution tendency. Um, however, they kill people. They, they murder people. They kill people in the street. They kill people in the courtroom. They kill people in the prison. They torture people and so on. They have blood on their hands fighting for that monarchist regime that they don't believe in, you know, my point here is he doesn't depict the life of compromise 
as being one of peaceful resignation to getting along with the, the powers that be in this world or something, to getting along in lockstep with um, the drumbeat of civilization and then living a peaceful life in contrast to being a revolutionary and having blood in your hands. He is really saying to you, no, you are going to have blood in your hands either way. You're literally going to have to kill people, whether it's for monarchy or republicanism, whether it's for a corrupt dictatorship or for the ideal of, of democracy. Now, again, someone could look at that and say, okay, so there is no compromise. Um, no, there is compromise. One of the differences is, do you live in a palace or do you live as a peasant in poverty? Uh, do you live in a, in a cave in the woods? Um, you know, the people who make the compromise, they literally they go to the opera and they eat the finest food and so on. And the people who don't compromise are living in these, these terrible conditions. So, you know, I would compare this, if you look at the book as a whole, if you look at the structure and purpose of, of the writing, it is actually fundamentally similar to The Water Margin, uh, a Chinese literary classic. Now, if you guys have never heard of The Water Margin, hey, what is a more bizarre title? Uh, the Charterhouse of Parma, which is itself a hilarious mistranslation of Chartreuse de Parma. Chartreuse does not mean Charterhouse. How we ended up with this English title, I don't know. W which is a more bizarre title, Charter Charterhouse of Parma or the, uh, the Water Margin? The Water Margin is also referred to as um, Heroes of the Marsh in English. Now, the Water Margin, um, is there a single morally positive character in the Water Margin? No. Not even one. The water margin, as a literary classic in Chinese tradition, is very interested in showing you this is how the court system works. This is exactly the way trials are corrupt. This is exactly the way people get away with crimes. One of the characters early on gets away with murdering his own wife and so on. Um, this is exactly the way uh, local governors and magistrates work, the way government works and so on. It's this really detailed condemnation, step-by-step, uh, step, it goes on for hundreds of pages, about every aspect of Chinese society is absolutely terrible. It's unspeakably awful. And significantly, it does not counterpose to this um, a revolution. It does not counterpose to this a utopia. It counterposes to this bandits. <laughs> it counterposes to this gangsters. And each bandit has a different story. Each bandit, to generalize, and there's some exceptions here, basically they were all people trying to live a normal life, trying to be part of society. And at some point or another, they ran into the corruption and evil of society and ended up being outcast, become cast out of it. And they go to live in a cave next to the marsh. Thus, it's called the water margin. Here's the marsh. They end up joining this gang of, of bandits. And these bandits are not um, even glorified in the way Robin Hood is glorified. They kill people and take the money of the victims. You know, there's nothing uh, idealistic. But the water margin, at various times, it's been censored and suppressed in China because it does fundamentally have a revolutionary message. It is saying this whole society is bad and evil and wrong. It's showing you in quite some detail how it's bad and wrong. Just to give you an example, actually, both books. See, again, this is why Charter of is such a good comparison. You may ask, why does this describe the writing of letters in so much detail? Because in this historical period, you know, uh, people are not scanning a QR code. You know, they're not using plastic ID cards. Uh, politics relies on handwritten letters. The proof that you are who you say you are is handwritten. And, oh, I have a letter from this aristocrat that explains who I am and where I'm going. The writing of letters, the forging of letters... Uh, the condemnation of someone. So someone gets tried and put in prison or executed because someone wrote a false letter that seems to be written by them. And, you know, the writing of genuine letters in order to attain particular political ends. He's showing you the mechanics of how politics really works in great detail. Likewise, the water margin, again, if you're just reading it, and you're not aware of the political significance of the book. Why is this describing in such detail how an aristocrat in one village sends a handwritten letter to, you know, the manager of an estate in another village. And, you know, it's really showing you and it's really criticizing how society works. And in the water margin also, they get into um, 
uh, imitating another person's handwriting so that you you intercept the letter this aristocrat is sending to this castle and then you have someone try to copy the handwriting and change the message slightly to change political outcomes or make something else possible. Both books are in this way really interested in showing you um, not just the why, but the how of this society. Not just why it's an evil society, not why it has to change, but exactly how this evil society works, how it's evil, and how this uh, makes everyone's life evil. And again, um, you could pick out and put together all the different senses in which he says it, but at many different points, I mean, at least five different points, he just says in one sentence, sometimes as one of the characters speaking, Sometimes just as the author speaking, he just says, look, this is how life is under a tyranny. And that's it. There's no happiness for anyone. Like, that's... <laughs> it's just a total condemnation of the society. Uh, but my point is this. In the same nihilistic and somewhat evil sense that the water margin embraces the egoism and violence of bandits... That like the society is so bad, the author is willing to kind of speak well of of outright bandits and gangsters. Um, in the same sense, I think you have to see this book as condemning that society to such an extent that the, I mean, his political position, from even my perspective, is kind of evil. It's not quite bandits he's endorsing, but it's that sort of thing. Um, he is endorsing the most hypocritical evil opposition to the status quo um, that exists, whether those are the people who've sold out and work within the system, uh, or it's the people who've refused to sell out and are literally become highway robbers, literally, because there are some characters like that who are out, you know, robbing and occasionally killing people uh, to survive and to keep the dream alive of a better political regime. So in this sense, it is a really authentically revolutionary book and I'd say it's much more interesting than uh, the water margin in this respect. I mean, the water margin is interesting because it's about China. If you want to know about history of China, that's interesting. It's worrying. But uh, Stendhal uh, Chartreuse de Parma is interesting because it leads the reader to reflect on a question I've asked again and again on, on my channel. In what ways am I a revolutionary? In what ways is the life I'm living right now uh, revolutionary in what ways can i be a revolutionary um, whether that's working within the system or outside of it uh again whether or not that is a meditation in the text uh i'm not saying stendhal does the thinking for you i'm not saying he answers the question for you but the text is leading you to ask that question again and again and uh, i'm not saying this to insult my audience Obviously, for many of you reflecting on your life, the lost loves you've had, your romantic life, you know, pathetically, that may be the main thing. Looking back at your life, that would have been different. Oh, when I was younger, if I had been more reckless, if I had been more of a revolutionary, then my relationship with this woman, that would have gone totally differently. <laughs> here's, here's a real example. I think I've never mentioned this to you before, Melissa. You know, I remember... Uh, there was a teaching assistant in my university. So this woman isn't a professor, but she's also not a student. She's halfway between a student and professor. She probably has a PhD. And I was quite attracted to her. I was pretty good looking back in those days. <laughs> and I was a lot more intellectual than any of the students. And I remember I was kind of, you know, uh, taking the first steps to uh, to seduce her. And she mentioned in front of me, she didn't say to me, she was saying to another student, uh, that she's that she's married. And I remember I just, you know, that's it. I totally canceled. I, oh, it's fine. Uh, but, you know, I think you can imagine I was mostly interested in her because she was intelligent, cared about politics and so on. But she was she was good looking. And obviously she was older than me, you know. Anyway, I remember I told my mother about this. I said, oh, you know, there was this one person because basically nobody in the whole university campus I felt was intelligent enough to be worth drinking coffee with. Oh, yeah, this one, but, but she's married. And it's, I remember the day I died, my mother said to me, dead serious, and my mother is an old revolutionary. She is someone who lived her life by very reckless rules, very high stakes rules. She's someone who rolled the dice and all these things. She said to me, 
you know, if you don't try to seduce this woman, like I know she, like you're telling me she's married, but if you don't take the risk, if you don't try to seduce her, you might regret it for the rest of your life. You know, and she said, and this is just show, she's got experience. <laughs> she said, yeah, you know that she's married. You don't know how unhappy her marriage is. You don't know that she might want to, like, you don't know. Like, you don't know until you try. <laughs> So you tell me, was this the corrupting influence of an older uh, person on a younger? Now, look, I, I'm just saying this to briefly like embrace and be honest with you about how shallow most people are, how shallow the supposedly revolutionary questions are that you may ask yourself. Um, I have to look back at my own life politically and ask all kinds of questions. The, the, the kind of compromise situation he describes here. Do, are you aware that I am an anti-communist? And I was an employee of a communist government in Southeast Asia, the Lao People's Democratic Republic, known as Laos, right? I was willing to make the compromise to work inside the communist government at a very low level, needless to say. I learned a lot working inside uh, the government. A, a, a lot of you will feel a similar kind of compromise. You hate the university system. You really want to transform the university system or destroy the university system. But you make your compromise and work inside the university system. In Laos at that time, and so there were literally people in caves fighting against the communist government, literally living in caves with machine guns. I could have been out there involved in that. Right next door was Myanmar. There was a civil war going on. Right now, in case you don't know, there still is a civil war in Myanmar. It's a civil war being fought for democracy. Um, when I was in Cambodia, I was doing humanitarian work. Uh, I regarded then and still regard now the current government of Cambodia as utterly morally despicable. I won't digress. Uh, by all means, go ahead and Google it, guys. Google Hun Sen, H-U-N space S-E-N. Um, it's, it's not as simple as saying it's a communist government, but it's an utterly despicable, terrible government. Well, I wasn't living as a revolutionary or a rebel against the government of Cambodia. And look, at different stages of my life. So again, in my case, I'm not that shallow. It's not all about my sex life, the way for almost every character, not every character, but most of the characters in this book, they're consumed by things to do with their sex life and living in luxury and these kind of petty things, which no offense for most of you guys is too. You know, um, every stage at which I kind of came back to Canada, I had to ask myself this question, how am I going to be a revolutionary? In what ways are the life I'm leading revolutionary? And for one crucial period of my life, the answer to that was studying the Cree language, studying the Ojibwe language, studying Algonquian languages, studying the languages of the indigenous people that are now getting closer and closer to total extinction. Very few people can speak anymore and getting involved with the politics of asserting some kind of meaningful future for our indigenous people against a government that was until recently genocidally opposed to them and now has this kind of namby pamby slow motion geno genocide approach to them. From, from an indigenous people's perspective, Canada has never been a democracy and, and still isn't now. So big challenges. Now, again, this is not, uh, look, uh, <laughs> implicitness, there's more than one way to be a revolutionary, right? Um, it's not the case that the only way to be a revolutionary or the best way to re be a revolutionary is to live a life of violence. As little as I may have accomplished as a scholar of Buddhism, and doing humanitarian work, and as a scholar of Free and Ojibwe, and being involved in First Nations, I accomplished something. And if I had lived in a in a cave, I would have accomplished uh, nothing. And uh, in case you hadn't noticed, I had to ask myself this question again and again on this YouTube channel. Basically, I would say in, in reference to ecology. Um, most of you think of me as someone who cares about veganism, but I think it's fair to say I care first and foremost about ecology. I care also about democracy. Tremendously, you may have noticed. And then within that, okay, in what way am I going to be a revolutionary? In what way am I going to be engaged with ecology? In what way am I going to be engaged with veganism? In what way am I going to be engaged with democracy? And you have seen me on this uh, channel struggling to come up with new answers again and again. And one of the answers is simply to be more like Stendhal himself. One of the answers is to be a creative artist, to be a writer to be a filmmaker, or to be a stand-up comedian. Um, there is certainly a sense in which somebody like Chris Rock, Chris Rock is a stand-up comedian, as, as small a percentage of his material as may have been uh, political, nevertheless has accomplished something in the world politically. 
and the vast majority of, of African American radicals have accomplished instead absolutely nothing. Okay, so that is my closing meditation on the meaning of Stendhal um, in the year 2023. And it is certainly a bizarre irony that the public political figure who's drawn attention to Stendhal and sparked a renewal of literary interest in him is somebody who is politically at the diametric opposite extreme, the neo-Christian <laughs> uh, conservative iconoclast, Jordan Peterson.